get out your bulletins. Today we conclude our series that we are, have called Like a Child, and this is the series big idea that we've been talking about over the last three weeks as we finish today. It's this right here. Receiving the life that Jesus offers means accepting his way of life like a child. In week one and in week three, we looked at this idea in Mark chapter 10 to where Jesus, he brings these kids around him. The disciples are pushing the kids away saying, Jesus doesn't pretty much have time for you. He's got more important things to do. And Jesus rebukes those disciples and he looks at the disciples and says, unless, (laughs) he says this, he goes, whoever doesn't receive me like a child will never, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. In essence, he's saying, Whoever receives my way of living like a child will experience the life that I have to offer you. Because his kingdom is a kingdom that is all about life. Jesus came so we can experience his life and his life comes as we receive his way of living. But we receive it in the posture like a child. And if you've, when Jesus said like a child, we, not necess- we might not necessarily understand what he was meaning by that. But in that day, children had no status. Children had nothing to offer. In fact, children then are a lot like they were to, are today. They're helpless. I mean, think about it. A child can't cook for themselves. A child needs everything. They, they, they don't have the opportunity to earn their way. They don't have the opportunity. They don't have a status they have that they can leverage. See, children are helpless. And we... In our posture toward the kingdom, we need to realize that we're helpless, that we can't earn a right status with God, that there's nothing we can do and nothing that we have, that that no ability that really we can use to leverage anything. And we need to look at God and say, God, we are helpless. We need you. And when we realize that, and we need life because we can't earn life on our own, we can't get it ourselves. And when we have that posture, it says, like a child, hey, I want to receive it, but not just receive it, but I I want to trust in it. You know, there's something powerful about a child's trust. A child will trust. A child will will take your truth for the word of it, and and they'll they'll go with it. See, there's something powerful also about that. And in this series, we've been looking at six truths that we teach every one of our kids here that come to our uh, kids' Sunday environments. Six truths that we want them to know before they l- enter middle school. These are powerful truths. These are biblically Jesus-centered truths that we want them to know, that we believe that will guide their life, that will protect them in life. And the truths that we've been talking about are this. The first week, we talked about two truths. The first one is that God made us, and the second one is that God loves us. And I would like to just remind you, man, what would it look like in your life? Just remind you of this question. What would it look like in your life That if you truly believed and you lived life like you believed and you trusted that God loves you and and God made you, that God made you because he loved you, how would that shape your identity? How would that shape who you are and who you're becoming? And then week two, we talked about this truth, that Jesus wants to be my friend forever. That Jesus, when we put our trust in Jesus, he gives us his Holy Spirit who never leaves us. And here's the powerful thing about Jesus as our friend is Jesus is a friend who shows up in the good times and the bad times. And he never, ever leaves us. That no matter what you go through, you have a friend that is with you there. That you have even better than a friend. It's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. It's God himself that is with you at all times. And what would it look like to live life knowing that you have someone with you no matter what you face in the good and the bad? And then in week three, we talked about this truth that I can trust God no matter what. And this is what we talked about last week. And we ended up thinking this, uh, having this, this big idea that if I can trust Jesus with my salvation, then I can trust Jesus no matter what. That Jesus came and he did the impossible. He conquered death. He comes back to life and did what was impossible to show you and I that all things are possible, including our salvation. And it's possible that you can trust him no matter what you're going through. And today we're going to finish this series off with two truths. And so today I'm going to give you two final truths. I'm going to give you three questions and we're going to wrap it up in one statement that you can remember. Did you get that? You'll get it, I hope. 
Here's the first truth that I want to talk about today. A truth that you want your kids to know, and a truth that I believe is powerful for our own lives as adults, it's this right here, is I need to make the wise choice. Now, this is a truth. This is not a suggestion. This is a truth that when you make the wise choice, it does something for your life. It, 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 it's very powerful in your life. And we need to make the wise choice. This is something you want your kids to know because you want your kids to understand that they need to make the wise choice, not necessarily the popular choice. That they need to make the wise choice, not necessarily the socially acceptable choice. They need to make the wise choice, not necessarily, not necessarily the choice that they want to make in the situation without looking at the filter of what is wise. But something happens as we become adults. See, when we want something for our kids, but there's something that happens when we become adults. We become great at deceiving ourselves. See, you're the best person into tricking yourself as to what might be wise. You are the best person at justifying to yourself what is why. See, we can trick ourselves into believing something is why, and we can trick ourselves into justifying our own choices. Isn't that ha what happened? <laughs> right before you did the thing that you later regretted? I mean, after all, you heard you shouldn't do that. You had maybe colleagues that say, don't go into business with that person. You maybe had a parent that said, I don't want you hanging out with that person. You maybe had someone, don't date them in your life. But you knew better. And, and you knew better and you thought you could make the wise choice because your happiness was very important. And who knows more about you and knows what's better than, for you than you? And that, I mean, at the core of every one of our regrets, we all have a common denominator, and that's the person that we look at in the mirror every day. See, we believe we know what is best for us. And so we'll say, don't judge my choices. I know what's wise for me. See, we think we know what's wise for us. And we tell our kids to take advice that sometimes we as adults, we don't really listen to ourselves. This is what the wisest man who ever lived said. He said this. I want you to read this with me. It's in Proverbs chapter 3. He says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Now, I believe this is a very powerful verse. And maybe you're not even a churchgoer, but you maybe heard this verse at some point. Maybe you saw this walking through Hobby Lobby, or maybe you grew up and you grew up in church, but you maybe walked away from church. Maybe something happened in your life, but you remember something in the past. You remember this verse. And you remember, yeah, this is a good verse. This is, this is something that we kind of take a little solitude in. That, that in those moments of life that, that, man, when life doesn't go our way, that we come back to this verse. But I know that we read this verse different than the way we live this verse. Let me read it to the way that I think that most of us live it, sometimes including myself. That trust in the Lord with part of your heart and lean on your own understanding. In some of your ways, submit to him and he will make you happy. I mean, isn't that kind of the message of the church? It's become like, hey, you follow, he'll make, you follow Jesus, he'll make you happy. That, 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 but that's not what it reads. See, trust in the Lord with all your heart, which he's saying passionately trust in a God and tr trust in him more than anything or anyone else. And, with all, and lean not on your own understanding. In other words, when you don't understand, put your trust in. In Jesus. Put your trust in the God, the source of all wisdom. And then he goes on to say, in all your ways, not some of your ways. See, I like some of my ways. That's a little easier for me to understand. But all my ways, Jesus? No, in all your ways. Submit. That means to say, in everything I have, in every way I, of option I have, God, I want your way, and that's more important in my way. That's hard. It's easy for me to tell my kids, you need to make the wise choice. But it's hard for me to trust in the Lord. And the reason is because I feel like I'm wise. 
I feel like I've got my best interest in, hand, play, in mind. I feel like I have me figure it out. But look what, look what King Solomon, the wisest man who ever lives, says this. Do not be wise in your own eyes. And he goes, fear the Lord and shun evil. Now, let's get involved in this here. I, wanna, I want you to participate here. So let's repeat what he says. Let's repeat that, do not be wise in your own eyes. Will you repeat that with me? Just say that with me. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Now look at your neighbor, because they need to know this. Just look at your neighbor and say, do not be wise in your own eyes. Say it, do not be wise in your own eyes. And, and you know what, because this is what we love to do. We love to tell other people this. We, I mean, this is easy. We want to tell our boss this. I mean, we really want to tell our boss. Maybe there's a coworker you want to tell this. Maybe there's an ex you want to tell this. There's a little too much laughing on that one. <laughs> but you need to tell you, yourself this. So let's make this personal now. Do not be wise in my own eyes. Will you say that with me? Do not be wise in my own eyes. Say it with me again. You need to know this. Do not be wise in my own eyes. See, you need to realize that you're not the source of wisdom. You're not the source of what's the wisest thing for you. In fact, the wisest man who ever lived would say there are other sources of that. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. In fact, you need a fear. And that means not be afraid of necessarily. It means to have this respect and this reverence for God that you want his way more than all because he's the source of all life. And the source of all life is found in his wisdom. And in this, it's not only that, but you need to listen to the counsel of others. And the wisest man would say you need to listen to the counsel of others. Don't look to yourself as the source of all wisdom. Open your eyes to what God wants and what others want. That is the source of wisdom. And we, un unfortunately, have our happiness as the source of our wisdom and not our wholeness. And when we trust in the Lord with all our heart, it leads us to what I believe will create wholeness in our life that might not be momentary happiness, but will be finality in our joy no matter what we go through. See, God is the source of that wisdom. And here's what wisdom does for you and I. See, write this in. See, wisdom directs and it protects. It, it gives direction. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path. He will give you direction in your life. You need direction in your life? Seek wisdom, but realize wisdom is outside of yourself. You need to go to God and you, may be, you need to have the voice of others speaking into you. Primarily the voice of God. It directs us and what it does is it protects us in our life. And so we've got a question that we ask in our church and you've heard us teach about this. We've taught on this last year. I teach this in my home. This is something my wife and I live by. It's a question that we ask every day at different times, whether it's in, in, um, in, in explicitly or explicitly, we ask this question. What is the wise thing to do? I encourage you to. That's the first question I want, to, I want you to begin to ask on every opportunity you have. What is the wise thing to do? What is the, you owe it to yourself to know the answer to this question. You owe it to your family. You owe it to your future. You owe it to your employees. You owe it to your colleagues. You owe it to you to know the answer to this, but not just know the answer to it. You owe yourself not the courage to also apply it this to your life. What is the wise thing for me to do? And it's not about my kids anymore. This is about us as adults. And that leads to the second truth that we teach that finishes up the truths that we teach in our grade school area. And that's this, that I should treat others the way I want to be treated. <laughs> You're like, I came to church to hear this? Yeah. See, isn't this something you want your kids to know? I mean, after all, this is something we teach our kids at a young age. In our home, just a couple days ago, maybe even it happened yesterday, one of my children took something from the other child, and, I, and you go back to them, and you just go back to the lesson of the golden rule that is emphasized here, and you say, hey, now, so-and-so, you wouldn't want so-and-so to take that from you, when you if you were playing with it, so you need to do for them what you would want them to do for you. You know, this is a great way to keep us out of trouble, isn't it? This is a great model and a sense of morality to have. 
And this has been around a long time. In fact, Jesus elevates this in his kingdom life. And so it's not just a, a, a moral way to live. This is a kingdom way to live. And this is what Jesus says in, in Mark, Matthew chapter 7. I want you to read it along with me. He says this, so in everything. And I want you to circle that word everything because that is so important to this. He goes, in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. And then he puts a little addendum to this. He goes, for this right here sums up the law and the prophets. And that law and the prophets were a guidebook, if you will. It was a way of living that, that this is how you are to live. You, this Hebrew nation, and this is who he was talking to, this Hebrew nation, who grew up as, a, as a, their, their, their beginnings were a beginning that, that came and they boomed and they were in slavery and all they knew was oppression. And in this exodus that they have, God said, I need to give you a way of living so you know what is right to do with each other because you haven't, been, you had it, you haven't had a good model of this. That you, I don't want you to live like the Egyptians. I want you to live like a new nation that's under the kingdom of God, which is a new way of living. And that means that, that you treat each other in a right way. That is I'm, how I'm establishing it. And so the law and the prophets, the law would direct them how to do this, and the prophets would come and remind them of how they should live the right way. And Jesus says, hey, treating others the way that you want to be treated, write it in, is the right thing to do. It's the right thing for you and I to do. Now, here's the powerful thing about this truth. See, I believe that this is a great golden rule that keeps us out of trouble. But you know what Jesus doesn't say? It's just for that. He says, in everything. And while this is a great rule that a, and a guide to your life to keep you from heart doing something to somebody else that you shouldn't do because you don't want them to do it to you, you know what the, more importantly this is? This is the way that we operate when people have wronged us. When you're the one who's hurt, when you're the one that has suffered, this is what you do. That you do to others what you wish they would have done to you. See, it's not just something that you do to initiate something. Because this is what we wanted to say. No, 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 no. As soon as they do something to me, the game over on that rule. That's done. And now it's do as they have done. Uh uh. See, it's in everything. See, when, when that coworker does something and it takes something from you, it doesn't mean that you have to take something back. And when, when they say that about you on Facebook, that doesn't mean that you lash out. See, Jesus would teach, and his, his teaching was so kingdom, life-giving, that it would look so different to this community that they would go, what are you saying? Things like turn the other cheek? I mean, you only can turn the other cheek when it's been slapped. After you've suffered, this is what I want you to do. I don't turn. That I want you to love your enemies. In order for them to be an enemy, that means you have had to have suffered at the selfishness of somebody else. But to love them? See, this is the right thing to do. So this is the question I want to ask in this scenario. Is what is the right thing to do? What is the right thing to do? What is the right, not just what's wise in this moment, because my wisdom can be kind of filtered, but Jesus, what's the right thing for me to do? Someone will always offend you. Someone will always take something from you. Some, someone's going to hurt you at school. You're going to be the one who suffers. But what is the right thing for you to do? And it's not so you can earn God's love. See, that's not the point. It's not that you can get God and you can do the right thing to get God on your side. No. It's you do the right thing because of what Jesus has already done for you. That you and I can do what is right because of what Jesus did for us. We do what is wise and we do what is right because we've received God's love. The Apostle John writes a letter. And the Apostle John was a man who walked with Jesus. He lived life with Jesus. He saw Jesus in, in the moments that nobody else saw him. 
There, he, he knew that Jesus always thought the right thing and always thought what was wise. He, he, he knew that Jesus always spoke what was wise and what was right, and Jesus always did and acted in what was wise and right. In this letter that he sends out, he, kind, he reminds the people of something. And he goes, for this is the message you've heard from the beginning. Again, he's talking to this Hebrew audience. And he goes, not just the beginning of my letter. This is not the message that you heard. I'm talking about the beginning of time. That in the beginning that we all have read in Genesis 1.1, this is the message we've all heard from the beginning. This is the message you've heard. And in this culture, they grew up learning the text of the law and the prophets. And John reminds them, this is the message you've heard from the beginning. Love one another. That we should love one another. Not that you can think about it. Not that you should be encouraged to this. That this is a must language. That you should love one another. And then he goes to remind them of the history. He goes, don't be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And, they, and why did he murder him? Hypothetical question in a way. He goes, because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. And anyone who does not love remains in death. <laughs> Here, here's just the hi highlight of it. See, kingdom life that we receive from a kingdom love leads us to live in a way that we love with a kingdom love. And when we've received that and we've passed from death to life, there is something that we now have a source of life that leads to love because love gives life. And we pass personally from death to life. And in this, he goes on, he says, anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. This is how we know what love is. This is how. See, and just to back up for a second, we can say that it's okay to harbor hate because of what people have done. And Jesus says, not so with you. He goes, you've heard it say, it's okay to hate your enemy. But I tell you, see, the kingdom life that Jesus offers and to receive that life like a child means to sometimes let go. And love not based on how, what they've done to us, but love on the way Jesus has loved us. Now, in this, back to the children idea. See, kids are great. They're great at letting go of grudges. As adults, we're not so great. See, we like to hold it in. But Jesus in, taught differently. And John says that anyone who hates his brother or sister is a murderer, and, and, and when we harbor hate, that life is not coming out of us. That kingdom life isn't. And then he goes on to remind us, this is how we know what's been done for us and what love really is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions, this is the practical way to do it, he says. If anyone has brothers, uh, material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. See, the right thing to do is always the loving thing to do. And the loving thing to do is always the right thing to do. See, we love others in the way Jesus has loved us. And it's almost like this becomes the platinum rule. That's what this is. See, the platinum rule is this. Treat others the way Jesus has treated you. You know the way I should treat others? The platinum rule, golden rules, rules get. The golden rule is great. But the platinum rule that I need to treat others the way Jesus has treated me, that's what leads to the life of the kingdom. And that leads me to love others so they can experience the life of that kingdom as well. See, it's to treat others the way Jesus has treated us. To do for others what Jesus has already done for us. That when we do for others what Jesus has done for us, you know what I believe? I believe we honor Jesus. I believe that the most beautiful thing and the most 
worshipful thing that you can do and the most honoring thing that you can do with your life is to honor the one who gave up his life for you by loving others the way he's loved you. That's the most honoring thing that you can do. And that leads to that third question, is what honors Jesus? Jesus, <laughs> I know that, this, that they've been wronging me all this time, but Jesus, what honors you in this? Not because of what they've done to me, but what you've done to me. How do I, how do I respond to what you've done, not what they've done? How do I honor you in this? How do I respond to what you've done, Jesus, for me instead of what they've done to me? What honors Jesus? See, honoring Jesus begins, and I want you to write this in. See, it starts with my thoughts, then is heard in my words, and then becomes seen in my actions. We honor Jesus in that harboring of hate that, that John talks about. Man, that, that's something up here in our mind. Nobody sees the hate <laughs> When it begins, but you do, and you know it. And Jesus, in my thoughts about the other person, is that thought honoring you? Does that thought respond to them the way you've responded to me? How do I honor you in my thoughts? And how do my words now honor you? And then let that lead to my actions. How do they honor you? And that leads me to the teaching big idea for today, where we wrap it all up in one, this one statement. It's, a, it's not just a statement today, it's a prayer. And this is a prayer I encourage you, I challenge you to pray every day. This is a prayer that I pray every day. I pray it with my kids every night. Why? Because this is something that I believe leads to the life that God wants for them regardless of what happens to them, that will lead to the wholeness that I believe God wants for them instead of their happiness, but not just for my kids, but it's for me. And I want this for you. Will you pray this to say, Jesus Help me choose what is wise, right, and honors you in everything I think, say, and do. That Jesus, help me choose what is wise, what is right, and what honors you in everything. In everything. Not just the things, <laughs> not just the things that, that, that protect me, but the things that after they've hurt me, may I do what's wise, right, and what honors you in everything I do. Help me choose what is wise, right, and honors you. The night before Jesus goes to the cross, he gathers his disciples together in this upper room. And he says, and he gathers them there, and they're celebrating an old covenant. But in this moment, he, remind, he, he directs them to a new way that he wants them to live. And he says this right here. A new command I give you. And in this moment, it's so important to understand that this new command <laughs> was something that, that the disciples know. No, only there were lawgivers. Moses was the guy who was the voice of God. Jesus, I don't know about you. Why, why are you stepping into this I command you language? But Jesus says, a new command I give you. See, every command was connected to a covenant. And the Old Testament represents the old covenant of God. And Jesus comes to, to fulfill that old covenant, to, to, to finish that homework, tie up a bow, and say that you don't have to accomplish it. I did that homework for you. And in his life and his death, and the disciples don't know what's about ready to happen, but he comes and he says, a new command I'm giving you because I'm establishing a new covenant with you. And he goes, a new command I give you, love one another. To which if he would have paused there, the disciples would go, that's not new. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He says, as I have loved you, so I encourage you. As I've loved you, would you think about this? No. As I've loved you, so you must love one another. And by this will everyone know. By, it, by this, you loving others the way I have loved you. By you, this, you treating others the way I have treated you. By you doing for others, not what they've done for you, but what I've done for you. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples. By this, all men will know that you <laughs> have received the life of a kingdom and you're living the life in the kingdom of God. And he would go on to say, this is my new covenant. It's in the wine that was represented there and in the bread. And today we're going to 
do what Jesus started on this day. And I believe Jesus started this on this day because we would constantly forget. Not necessarily what he's done for us, even though that's what we're remembering, but remembering what he's done for us reminds us of the command of what we do for others. So regularly, we need to step up here and we need to remind ourselves of what Jesus has done for us and what we need to do for others. And so this is what I want to ask you to do. In a moment, I'm going to release you, and you're going to step, stand up. I'm going to ask you to exit out the left side of your aisle, come forward, grab the elements that our, our men are going to have up here at the front, and you're going to grab them and return to your seat, hold on to this. But as you come, maybe you need to use this as a time to repent. And maybe this is an opportunity for you to say, God, I'm sorry that I have not been treating others the way you've treated me. God, I have not, I've been looking, I've been the source of my own wisdom. Or God, I haven't been honoring you and what you've done for me and how I am not living a, a life that is loving others. And I repent of that. And walking forward to remind myself of what you've done for me is also a prayer that Jesus, will you help me choose what is wise, right, and what honors you in everything I think, say. Will you make that your posture and your prayer? Will you come and get this and will you hold on to it and we'll celebrate this together? Men, will you come? Will you stand with me and exit out your left? Come and grab the elements and return back to your seat.